Um, so let me start the talk by telling you guys what you're going to be hearing today. Um, the talk is from zero to core quantum filter, right? So the talk is for those who want to leverage the Dojo program um, to accelerate their learning, um, eventually become a committer for Cloud Foundry, and also for those who want to learn about the processes the staff teams are using. So there are a number of topics we will be covering today. So the first one is stream programming. Right? It's a programming style that the CF teams are using. Um, we pair when we program. There's, there's always another person in this to you. Um, we try to solve the problem with two persons as a whole. Another topic is test-driven development, TDD. So it's another programming te technique the CF teams are using. Right? The Cloud Foundry code base is developed with TD style. So every single code, uh, piece of code or logic is covered by test. And the goal for the teams is to have 100% test coverage for the entire system. And then we're going to uh, we're going to talk about a CF foundation program called Dojo, uh, which the developer can leverage to accelerate the learning, not only the code base and also the CF uh, CF teams processes. And eventually, they can gain the committer access at the end of the program. And since not all the not all the committer and not all the team member in the uh, in the team are centrally located together, uh, there's a lot of remote collaboration happening. So um, we need some tools. We need some tooling to help to make this process possible. And we'll cover some of these process and tools that we're using to make remote collaboration uh, smooth and easy. So before I get into any of this topic, let me first introduce ourselves. My name is Simon. I'm from IBM. I'm the current anchor engineer for the CLI project. Uh, before I got into Cloud Foundry, not too long ago, uh, I was just a traditional programmer. Uh, I code a lot, but I don't really practice like pair programming, and I didn't really practice any TDD style. Uh, and I'm Derek. Uh, I started working at Pivotal just out of school, so I've been practicing extreme programming, TDD, um, from the beginning, essentially. And I've been on Cloud Foundry projects for about a year and a half now, uh, including the Services API team and the CLI team. Mm -hmm. So, Derek, we've been mentioning extreme programming for a couple of times now. Can you tell us a little bit more about it and what, why, what's the reason we're doing it? Sure. So, extreme programming. Um, sitting next to a guy all day, high fives. Um, but what is it really? So it's when two people are sharing one workstation, uh, one will be typing and navigating with the mouse, and the other, uh, the navigator, will be guiding, contributing through just making sure the process and everything is going well. Um, and the idea is that you will switch these roles every couple of minutes to an hour, depending on the feel of the code or what particular thing you're attempting to do. So I'm going to talk about some of the benefits uh, we've seen with extreme programming. Uh, shorter onboarding period for new team members. There's a huge cost in bringing someone new to your team, right? Um, they have to learn the code base. They have to learn the process. They have to learn a lot about what you do. Uh, and pair programming really helps alleviate this issue because they are consistently working with someone else, being brought onto the process, and just being nurtured and shown uh, what the team does. So it really helps speed up that process quite a bit. Uh, increased discipline. Increased discipline comes from working side by side with someone else. So you always have this immediate feedback loop in terms of what you're trying to execute on or what you're trying to do. So you're often going to do the right thing instead of the wrong thing because you have two sets of eyes on the piece of code or the piece of logic you're trying to implement um, instead of down the road uh, in a code review or something of that nature. Collective code ownership. Uh, this is something we really stress at Pivotal uh, in Cloud Foundry. Um, and that's everyone owns the code base uh, on the team. So there's no, I have this section. I'm in charge of you know, this algorithm, and it's mine. Uh, Everyone rotates through all pieces of the code base, all stories, all features, all bugs, um, as much as possible. So this really helps to 
reduce blame and also increase everyone's understanding of the general uh, code base and not like, oh, this guy left. I have no idea what that 3,000 lines is really supposed to be doing. Uh, mentoring. So younger de developers now can get sped up and like just start to learn process a lot faster. Um, this is because they pair with senior devs who are often just passing that knowledge off to them and allows them to really uh, speed up on the code base and being a good developer. Um, better code. So better code kind of comes from all these things, right? Uh, the huge part of this process is to produce better code at the end, produce tested code so that you have fewer bugs and fewer uh, iterations that you need to go back and work on bugs that were part of you missing them the first time. And a huge reason this happens is because of TDD. That's right. So TDD, what is it? Right? So TDD is actually a programming technique that we use. And the main goal of TDD is to produce clean, good code that actually works. So how do we do it? So in TDD, it's actually a software development process that relies on very short development cycle. First, the developer will write a test that detects what's the behavior or the new function that you want, want it to be. And then the developer will just produce just enough code to make the test pass. Right? With test passing, now you can reshape or refactor the code into a better standard, better design. And that's the full short cycle of a TDD. So here I have a graph to better illustrate how TDD uh, versus traditional programming. So on the left hand side, in TDD, you can see the first step, the very first step is to write a test, not the code. And at this point, the, the test is not going to pass just because there's no code there, right? So we will write the code. After, after writing the test, we will write the code to make the test pass. And after the test is passing, now you can refactor all you want and make sure the test is still passing and you have a cycle done. And you can repeat this cycle many, many times uh, in an hour. Whereas in traditional programming, as you can see, you don't really write a test first, but you design. You design what you want to do. You design the behavior, and then you actually go write the code. And then after that, you go back and verify whether the code is working or not. So one of the biggest drawbacks for tradi traditional programming is there's actually no good way to tell whether your changes like, have any negative impact to the system. Does it introduce any regression system? Does it, does it adversely impact the system as a whole? You don't know that, because there's no test to tell you that. So in TDD, tremendous test coverage is one of the benefits that it gives us, but it actually has many other benefits. So this is another one. TDD, TDD code usually they're maintainable, flexible, and easily extensible. What does that mean? Right? So the testing process in TDD actually is integrated in the, into the development process. It's integrated into the most granular level. So, when you code, you can make sure every single uh, standalone piece of logic or every single standalone piece of code, they're tested. So you can easily add new function, add new behavior, or remove, remove function and behavior without worrying about are you going to introduce regression. Because, because all you have to do is to run a test. If the test is passed, you're not breaking anything. Right? The second benefit, TDD is faster than writing code without test. Right, that's right. TDD can be really, really fast. You, 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 can, you can develop in TDD so much faster than... So let me put it this way. Writing code without, without unit tests, skipping unit tests is faster. That's until you actually want the code to be working. Right. So in our experience, in traditional programming, that's a big part of our development effort is actually spent after you finish writing the code. Right, you're debugging. You find something's wrong in the system, but you already checked the code into a repository. You're spending time to debug the system what's not working. So for example, I, I think we all have gone through this. I, I spend one hour to write a new function, and then I test it. Uh, yeah, you got the behavior I want. It's working. I put it aside. It's done. I'm happy, right? And then I find out there's some, something wrong with the system, and then I spend another five hours to debug it, right, just to find out the code I just write because uh, it's conflicting with a test or with a code, a module that I've written two years ago. But there's no test there to verify that. And I spent five hours debugging on a code that I only, only spent one hour to write. 
So with TDD, uh, uh, writing the test first actually eliminates a big part of this effort. Right? Uh, and the reason is that because uh, it allows you, with the test being there, it allows you to think, it allows you to get the code right, uh, a big part of it more right in the first try. And with the test being there, it also helps you to eliminate a lot more bug. You can debug much easier by running the test. So another benefit is it improves the design without breaking it. You, so improving the design is actually a step three in TDD. So code written in TDD style, you don't really need to refactor it most of the time. Right? But there are, time, uh, there are times that come, you want to integrate a new system, uh, or you want to integrate a brand new third-party module. Um, at that time, you can easily shuffle the code all you want, or you can refactor all you want. As long as the test is passing, you're not breaking anything. It's a killable documentation. So like it or not, developers, they don't really want to read written documentation, right? We just want to dive into the code and start working on the code base. I do it all the time. I don't know about you guys, but I believe you guys are doing the same. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> only when I get stuck, I stuck so much, I surrender, I go back and read the manual. But, but in TDD, the use cases are written as tests, right? The, Programmer or developer, they can easily just go to the test and look at like, what the test is doing, and from that they can understand what the behavior of the code is supposed to be, how it's supposed to function. And so, so TDD tests, they make excellent documentation. So there's a lot of benefits, but like everything else, nothing is perfect. There's always some drawback, right? Especially when you're a new, new TDD programmer. You have, you have a hard time to learn. It's really, really hard to learn. And I'm the first-hand example. In the beginning of me adopting Cloud Foundry as trying to write code in TDD, I was struggling really hard, right? I would spend an hour to write a piece of code, and then I would sit there and say, now I need a test, right? I need a test, and I don't know how to, how to write a test because I don't know what to cover. And, and the reason of that is because I don't think in terms of TDD. I don't write the test first. I don't think about the behavior first, right? So the struggling keeps on going until I had the opportunity to join the Dojo program, and that's actually the turning point of my learning. Cool. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit mm -hmm. about what the Dojo program is for Cloud Foundry. Um, so traditionally, to gain core committer access to an open source project, uh, it'll take up to a year, if not longer, if at all. Um, it's not easy. So what the foundation offers right now is the ability to gain committer access through this thing called the Dojo program. Uh, and what you'll do in the Dojo program is extreme programming and TDD and learn a lot about our processes. And this is for a span of about six weeks. And at the end of this, you will have core committer access and traditionally be able to rotate to another team within CF and continue to work on the project. Um, and Simon, you recently went through this about six, seven months ago. You want to tell us right. your experience with it? Yeah, sure. So um, I was in a Dojo program for eight weeks, and during which I was in the Diego team. Right? I learned a lot about the Cloud Foundry code bases. I learned a lot about TDD. I learned a lot about the CF team's processes. Right? And in these eight weeks, like, it actually transformed me from a traditional programmer to what I'm today. Right? It's pretty amazing if you think about it. Um, I can easily spend twice as much time to learn TDD on my own, and I wouldn't get nearly as far. So let me share my Dojo experience by, by telling you what you can expect during the program. Right? So in the Dojo, you can expect you will be pairing a lot. There will, there will be always a person next to you while you code. And they will always be looking over your shoulder, make sure you don't slack off. They will always ask you the right question for you to think. And they will be questioning every single of your decision. And that's a good thing. That's because your pair might not always be right but then they introduce this different angle to approach to a problem, right? They, they force you to rethink like, what approaches you should take to, to solve a problem. They re force you to re-examine if your process, if your approach is correct. So solving a problem with two people is always better than one. So this is actually a picture of actual pairing happening. So I get this picture from an old slide from Dr. Matt, so the credit goes to him. Um, as you can see, there's two persons looking at two monitors, and even though they're looking at two monitors, uh, they're looking at the same content. It's actually one computer. Uh, both of them has access to the keyboard and the, and the mouse. They can type and, and move the mouse at the same time, so you don't really want to do it at the same time. 
right? So usually what happens is like, one of them is the driver, the other one is the navigator. The driver will be typing on the keyboard coding, uh, doing actual work, and the navigator will observe, right? The navigator will try to see if there's any potential issues or constraints he should bring up. And the navigator and the, and the driver should swap role every, every now and then so you don't get bored. So the second thing you can expect is to write code in TDD. Um, I love it. So as I said before, like, TDD is really, really hard to learn on your own, right? And during the Dojo program, um, it's really helpful to have someone that's fluent in TDD sitting next to me, right? They force me, constantly force me to think in terms of TDD by asking the right question. They ask me, like, how do you want this code to behave? And what kind of test you can write right now to make sure the behavior is there? And the, is the test is validating the behavior correctly? And if I'm stuck, if I don't know what to do, my parents is there to help me solve the problem. Right? And when we finish the problem, my parents are there to help me to verify everything's correct and going all right. So another thing you can expect is you'll be, uh, there's not a lot of interruption. Like in the Dojo program, you'll be spend most of the time coding. And that's a good thing for programmer. Right? We want to code most of the time. We don't want to stuck in a meeting like, all, all day. But there's also a few meetings we will be attending. Um, these meetings are mainly designed to help with the agile process, to make it more smoother and, and better. And basically, they are also channels to encourage discussion, conversation, and to bring up issues for the team to discuss. So the first meeting that you will be attending every day will be a daily stand-ups. So during the Dojo program, there's actually two in a day. There's a big stand-up, there's a small one. So at now, crowd, everybody will gather around for the big one. Right. They talk about three things. The setup will be very, very brief. Only th three things will be talked about. The first one will be, um, uh, well, the first one will be help and interesting, interesting and help. So anyone with like, interesting topic, they can bring it up to share with people. Or if they have any issues, they can also bring it up and ask for help. And the other one, they will introduce, introduce new faces. Right. Um, any new people going to Pivotal, they will, they, will, they will introduce them and they will say hi and we'll get, uh, say hi as a group. It's a very friendly group over there. And the last thing we talk about is events. So there's quite a lot happening over there. It's fun. Uh, there might be wine tasting, game night, or maybe there's a TED talk during lunch. Like, they will talk about what events happened that day. And after that, the big group disband uh, into small teams and I'll go back to the whole team and that's where the team stand up happening. Right. We'll gather around the whiteboard. We talk about what we, what we have done the day before. Any blockage, any issues come up, we'll discuss it. And then we also, we, we'll also decide who to pair with who for the day. So another meeting is the IPM, Iteration Planning Meeting. So this is the meeting that usually happens in the beginning of the week, usually Monday. The teams come together with the PM. Um, we'll scope and estimate the work that we're going to do, go through, for the week, uh, we'll, we'll bring up any potential blockage or, or, or difficulties. And the team will also come together to vote on the difficulty on the story or the work we're going to do and record them in the backlog. And the last meeting you can expect to go to is the retro. And this is a fun meeting. It usually happens on Friday and you get beer and nuts. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a meeting basically for you to talk about the feelings. And you talk about the work that you have done uh, um, in the previous week. It doesn't have to be technical work. It can be anything from like technical blockage, or you can complain about the colon of your pair. Right? And it's a place for you to vent. And if there's any issues to, uh, coming up in, during the retro, there, there will be an action item generated. And the action will be taken to resolve the issues and, uh, and problem. So we will make the agile process, uh, process better next week. So during, uh, after the eight weeks, uh, I rotate off the Dojo program and transit into the CRI team, and that's actually when I met Derek. Yeah, so I want to talk to you guys a little bit more about the CLI team, and first, uh, why Simon rotated from one team to another after immediately finishing uh, the Dojo program. Huge reason we do team rotation is for that collective code ownership. Um, and that gets it throughout the company. It gets you vision on what the rest of the product is doing. Um, so it keeps people fresh. It keeps people uh, engaged in different parts of the product. Uh, so the CLI team is an interesting team. 
uh, for the foundation because it was the first team to be split 50-50 with IBM and Pivotal engineers. Um, so there were one pair of Pivotal devs and one pair of <laughs> IBM uh, developers. So um, the second part of that is after Simon's rotation, he was no longer coming into the office. So we had to do remote collaboration alongside his colleague. Uh, so we had a couple of tools we would use to handle things like pairing remotely and uh, meetings, uh, because you want to get that in-person feel. You don't want them to feel disconnected just because they're not in the office. Um, so we're going to talk to you a little bit about those. So face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, we handled these with Google Hangouts. Um, simple, easy to use. Uh, anything that we needed to traditionally write down on a whiteboard, we'd end up putting in an Excel spreadsheet or a Word document, really whatever fit best, um, got us what we needed out of the meetings. Um, second was the actual pairing. This is the hard part, right? This is seven to eight hours out of our entire day uh, working with someone else. So we wanted this to be pretty smooth. Um, and we used Screen Hero. Screen Hero did what we needed, given you needed a relatively good internet connection. Um, but what it allowed us to do is each have our own mouse cursor uh, and keyboard and uh, share a computer um, and do that really well and pretty seamlessly remotely. And it also integrated the voice chat so that uh, we wouldn't use the second program or anything related to that. Um, and then team accessibility. So now your pair or maybe the pair working remotely is not in the office, and they have a question for the runtime team. They have a question for the services API team. Um, how are they supposed to get in touch with them? How are they supposed to just walk over like we normally would and ask them a question? Um, the way we solve that right now is Slack. Uh, Slack is a great tool. It allows all teams throughout the entire company, different offices, everything like that, to hit each other up either on a direct level or at a team level with channels. Um, right, so it's good because it allows for that cross communication and the text editing is sane, parses markdown, you can read what they actually send you and not cry a little. So thanks, Derek. We're coming to the end of our talk. Um, we've covered quite a number of topics. So mm, we, we talk about the process the CF teams are using. We pair during we code, and the uh, Cloud Foundry code base are written in TDD. Uh, it's a very hard program technique to learn for newcomers. But luckily, in Cloud Foundry, we have this program dojo for you to leverage. Um, it really helps. It's, it's pretty awesome like, from personal experience. And also, there are people doubting that whether this agile process will work or not when not all the contributors are centrally located together. But I can tell you that with the help of tooling, it, it works. It works actually very smoothly. So like, I don't really feel the person next to me or the third person I'm pairing, they're not next to me. I can hear them, their voice real time. I can see them interacting on my computer real time. The only thing that I don't see is like if I turn my head over, they're not there. So this is the end of the talk. I hope the talk helped you to understand some of the uh, processes the CF teams are using and also help you, help you understand what the Dojo can offer you and can do for you. So right now we wanted to open it up to any questions you guys might have for us. Hmm. Any question? Yes. Uh, I think there's somebody coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> How much does it cost? So. Uh, so, so to better answer the question, we have our own foundation CEO here today, <laughs> and there's no better person to answer this question. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think she'll hand yeah, you yeah. that one. She's chasing you down. Sorry, Simon uh, asked me to show up. He said, I'm going to get some questions about the dojo uh, at the end, and I'm not sure I can answer them all. So I said, I promise I'll come. Uh, so the dojo is free. It's free by, uh, by mandate. Uh, every company that offers a dojo uh, access will be free, and we are guiding all of our dojo companies, including EMC, uh, GE is announcing a dojo today, uh, IBM uh, announced a dojo yesterday. The Cloud Foundry Foundation Dojo is being established starting June 1st in San Francisco at 535 Mission, uh, not too far from Pivotal, but also not too close, um, and we'll be hosting um, uh, Huawei and IBM contributors there. Um, it is not a revenue center, uh, and it is a gift to the community. It also has to be open to 
random community members who want to come in, uh, not just members of the foundation. Yeah, any, any more questions? Question? Yeah, thanks. Hi, uh, you mentioned that the process takes somewhere between six to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, what kind of things do you look for in terms of abilities with TDD in uh, the participants at that end? I mean, how do you determine whether it's going to be a 12-weeker or it's going to be a six-week? Uh, so the amount, how do we determine the amount of time that you would be in the program itself? Uh, no, not so much the time. What kind of um, level of mastery of TDD are you looking for by the end of that period? Because I presume that's what really determines how long it takes rather than sure, sure. whether it's six um, or 12. I don't know that we've had an experience yet to where we've had to say, all right, at the end of this, like, it, it's been more of a guideline six to eight weeks. It's when people have felt comfortable. We haven't hit a point in which it's like six, ten weeks in. It's like, all right, it doesn't look like you're getting it yet. Uh, a huge part of it is we do an interview before you come through the dojo program to make sure that it kind of aligns with, you know, um, our process and the process of the person coming in that they're open to it because it is something that everyone really wants to do, right? It's not something everyone really feels empowered to do. Um, so it's, uh, honestly, I can't tell you of a failure case we've had based off of, they've been in the dojo program and now we're like, well, actually, you know, this isn't gonna work out. <laughs> um, so I, I can't give you an exact guideline on that. We're not looking for anything specific at the end. Okay. So without a dojo program, can someone become a committer? Is there a way? Uh, that might be a better question. Is the, is the, the uh, oh, is, is it possible to turn this mic on, on the podium? Yes. All right, can you hear me? I can just belt. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's on. It's All right, on. it's on. Uh, Now that I've gone through all this, I've forgotten the question. Can you start again? Is there a way for you to become a core committer without It's being very a rare. So the only example that we can think of is Michael Frankel, um, who is uh, kind of a, you know, there are going to be other nuns such as in, uh, in the community, of course. Uh, uh, but to give you an idea of how Michael became a contributor, uh, he took it upon himself to rewrite the DEA. He said, this is in Ruby. This is kind of slow. Let me rewrite it idiom for idiom in Go. Did the whole thing, tested it, it ran, and he showed up with this pretty significant code contribution. That's probably not path A. Uh, so in general, in order to become a committer, you need to go through Dojo. It's not the only way to be a contributor. You can certainly contribute through, uh, through all sorts of different gifts, uh, requirements, uh, you know, uh, bug, uh, bug reports, uh, and PRs. In general, if you're going to submit a PR, be in conversation with the team. The lists are very, very open, right? You can see what's up. You can find out if it's in a story that's being run by the project lead, and then you can contribute. It's a very opinionated open source project. We're working on things in a very distinct, distinct way. We're building a distributed system software. Uh, so the best way to contribute, uh, to, to communicate with this team is not through random PRs, but signal, let us know that you're coming, and we'll help you, uh, we'll help guide you in. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw a question. Oh, I think, sorry. Where's the mic? Mike? Um, well, you're really close to us. Can you just tell us your question? A skill set. Okay. Yeah, I'll go ahead and answer this. So skill set when you enter Dojo. Um, this will be the last question. So skill set when you enter Dojo. Uh, generally, we look for someone with an openness to pair. Um, we have a pretty defined process for how to find out whether a person is open to that. Um, skill set is not based in any particular language or number of years programming or a degree um, in a particular way. Uh, it's really, we interview you, we decide through some set of metrics whether or not pairing is really going to work. Um, and that's both ways, right? Whether or not you're going to really like pairing and whether we think you're really going to be a good pair. Um, because that's super important to us. Um, so there's not an immediate metric that you need to have. Uh, it's really, are you open? Are you able to learn quickly and you know, learn new process? I'll make one, one comment about the, what, what I like so much about the engineers on this project is that the RPI, the test that he's referring to, uh, is structured. It does end up with a score. But one of the most interesting things is it explicitly tests for empathy. Yep. 
right? So for empathy with the other person and other people in the team that you're going to be working with, as well as empathy for the user. So hopefully that has made its way into the code and becomes evident in the community. Right. Awesome. So I think we're coming to the end of, uh, of the time. Um, we're out of time. Uh, I will be in the CLI open house at 11.30, which is at the hobby launch uh, at the foundry. So if you have any more questions, I'll be there. Um, we'll hand around a little bit right now uh, for 10 minutes. And thanks for coming. And thanks, Sam, for uh, being here, answering all the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.